Melanie Yazi, welcome to COVID Race and Democracy. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us what's important for our listeners to know about you and about your work? Uh, well, thank you so much for having me on the show, Ken. Yat e everyone. For any Navajo or Diné listeners, i uh, just going to establish kinship in my language really quickly and then go on with my introduction. So, Yat e shik e do shit ne e Melanie Yazi in ishe, Bilagan in ishle, ma in the shkijni bashes chin, Bilagan adashe chirot hotsani dashe nala, Behalge de de nasha akut alz adene nishle. I am a citizen of the Navajo Nation. Um, I just listed off my clans for the folks who care about such things, <laughs> Navajo people. Um, I'm also an assistant professor of Native American Studies and American Studies at the University of New Mexico, um, based in the main campus in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, I am also co-founder and um, have been a longtime organizer with a grassroots indigenous liberation organization called the Red Nation, uh, formed in our early days in Albuquerque, grew uh, during the pandemic, and then we shrunk back down again because of the pandemic. <laughs> and so I'm mostly still based in Albuquerque again, where I'm at. Um, I do work on a number of issues. And by, when I say work, uh, I do intellectual work, but all of my intellectual work is political. I don't really see a distinction between the two. And I do work on um, feminisms and uh, like indigenous queer politics. I do work on policing and carcerality and abolition of course, on settler colonialism and decolonization, uh, the history of indigenous social movements, specifically Navajo or Diné social movements. Uh, and I do a broader history in American 20th century um, and 21st century American Indian history um, and Navajo history specifically. And I also do work on the environment. Um, so I do work on the politics of water as it relates to tribal sovereignty um, and indigenous resistance movements. Um, as well as on resource extraction, which is a huge issue for Indigenous people, and of course relates very closely to the history of social movements that I both study and, um, and myself a historical and a social, social actor within those movements. So that's a little bit about me and my background. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Thank you. And can you say a little bit more about the Red Nation? When was that founded? And You've described some of the issues that you work on, but I also notice on the website you describe yourselves as indigenous revolutionary. So if you can yeah. say a little bit of what some of the core principles are for the organization. Absolutely. So the Red Nation was founded in almost exactly seven years ago, actually. Um, there was a, a famous first meeting around um, my and my partner's kitchen table in Albuquerque, New Mexico in November of 2014. And the organization um, came into existence kind of coming off of two particular incidents that happened in Albuquerque that year. The first happened um, in the spring of 2014. Um, this made national news, some may remember, but an unsheltered um, man was murdered brutally in the foothills by the Albuquerque Police Department. His name was James Boyd in the spring of 2014, um, which ignited an incredibly intense summer of confrontation with police. Um, a people's movement and police in Albuquerque. And uh, right sort of at the tail end of that confrontation when it was starting to calm down a bit, uh, two Navajo men, um, their street names were Cowboy and Rabbit. Their names are Allison Gorman and Keith Thompson were brutally murdered on the west side of Albuquerque. Uh, and so the reason why, even though those weren't police, those were vigilantes, um, what really sparked us into action in the Red Nation was trying to make connections actually um, between that, you know, what we think of as policing with people who wear badges and policing that's part of the larger structures of white supremacy um, and sort of settler identity and particularly settler masculinity in the United States. And that vigilantes um, and militias of the kind that we saw, you know, patrolling protests um, in, the, in the aftermath of um, George Floyd's murder last year, that, you know, understanding that those people who participate in those militias, many of whom are off-duty cops and correctional officers, um, are part of this larger kind of system of policing and, and carcerality in the United States. And then it's very much tied to, um, of course, anti-Blackness um, and the history of slave patrols. But in a place like Albuquerque, where there are a lot of Native people, um, Albuquerque is a reservation border town, meaning it's you know pretty much surrounded by um, Indigenous jurisdictional land, um, sovereign land, that Indigenous people are specifically targeted by police. Uh, because of the larger structure of uh, sort of disappearance um, that, that really drives settler colonialism. 
And so we were seeing that, you know, there was a national conversation, of course, uh, around Black Lives Matter, right? Black Lives Matter formed around this time around policing, right? And around police violence in the United States. Uh, but something we noticed was that there, there wasn't a lot being written or talked about when it came to Native people, um, actually, in policing, even though we found out quite quickly that um, Native people are actually killed at higher rates by police than any other demographic in the United States. And so we started to call this kind of constellation of sort of social and economic and police violence, state violence, border town violence. And that was really the bread and butter early on for the Red Nation. Um, and so we started to organize, not just to address border town violence, um, not just to engage you know, in confrontations with police, which we did. Um, Albuquerque Police Department actually killed people at higher rates per capita than any other city. Um, city police force in the country in 2013 and 2014, or maybe it was 2014 and 2015. So this was the climate in Albuquerque. And so um, we organized a lot of different things early on and that we continue to organize. Uh, we got Indigenous Peoples Day established in Albuquerque the next fall um, in September of 2015 um, to replace Columbus Day. It was a huge deal. Uh, you know, we sent delegations up to Standing Rock um, to the No Dapo front lines the next fall in 2016. Um, and there was a major uh, kind of uptick in indigenous resistance, especially land-based resistance in 2015 and 2016, that was very much kind of gave energy and fire, I think, to how the Red Nation grew so quickly in those earlier years. Um, we started to do uh, solidarity campaigns, what I think became known as mutual aid. I mean, mutual aid is something that's th that, that people have understood in the movement for a very long time, what that term means. But I think it became more popularized during the pandemic, right? You heard about mutual aid a lot. Well, we were doing mutual aid, you know, starting in 2015 um, for Native people who were living on the streets. Um, we call them our unsheltered relatives. We don't call them homeless because how can Native people be homeless in their own homelands um, is something that we say. And so uh, doing solidarity feeds, um, clothing them, providing housing. Um, for Native folks, especially poor um, working class folks, people on the streets. And so we've continued to do that pretty much every year uh, since we since we started that. It was called the No Dead Natives Campaign in 2015. Um, we've been very active in this uptick. I, I called it an uptick of Indigenous resistance against resource extraction all over Turtle Island or North America. Um, you know, really going hard um, about fracking, which is a huge industry in New Mexico, um, the devastation of Indigenous land, um, missing, murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls attached right to uh, the boom and bust cycles of the resource extractive industry. So we've done a lot of work on resource extraction, trying to stop resource extraction and trying to stop violence against Native women, um, youth and LGBTQ2 relatives. So these are some of the campaigns that we've done. I could talk for ages <laughs> about the things, but we've, you know, what I'm trying to say is that we very much have been a part of almost in the last decade, right? The, the cultural revolution that has happened in the United States, whether it's the toppling of statues, you know, monuments to genocide, um, conquest or white supremacy, um, the Confederacy, right? Uh, the, the movements, um, the incredible movements against police violence and for kind of an abolitionist future, um, as well as the incredible, you know, frontline resistance against resource extraction. Um, we've been a part of it all. And it's been pretty a pretty remarkable um, seven years. The pandemic made things really hard. So that was like less remarkable, I would say, mm -hmm. for us the last two years. But I imagine that's the case for a lot of organizers and activists. Um, and just on a kind of a final note, uh, we also have been very conscious over the years of developing very clear politics about what we mean when we call ourselves revolutionaries. Um, we believe in internationalism. We believe in left internationalism specifically. You know, we believe in solidarity with uh, folks who are struggling in the global South, for example, um, our indigenous relatives in Latin America. We have a great deal to learn from them about how to struggle and how to struggle together. We've sent multiple delegations to Palestine. Um, for example, we have very strong politics around Palestine. So internationalism is very important to who we are. Because we know, right, that um, as indigenous people who are citizens of this terrible empire beast, right, that is the United States, that it is, you know, our responsibility um, to free the rest of the world, you know, from the greatest purveyor of violence throughout the globe, which is the United States. 
um, through its imperial, you know, project. Um, and so we take it, we take that responsibility very seriously. Whilst we also, you know, believe in liberation for our people here, the liberation of the land, you know, from the violence of extractive capitalism, um, from the violence of white supremacy, um, you know, and settler colonialism. And we very staunchly believe in the leadership of native women um, and LGBTQ2 relatives and youth. Um, if you look at any front line that's happening right now throughout Turtle Island, where there's an indigenous struggle going on, it's those people who are leading it and that's happening for a reason. And so our leadership and our politics very much reflect that we have a very strong kind of queer feminist ethic uh, in the way that we relate to each other. We relate to our base, um, we relate to the land, of course, right? And that we relate to you know, the rest of our comrades who are in struggle. And so this is how we see ourselves um, as indigenous revolutionaries, really belonging to the long traditions that came before us and always, always trying to create a vibrant, beautiful future, not just for you know, indigenous people and our people, but for all, all of humanity, you know, especially as we're staring down this very, this ticking time bomb of climate change and climate disaster. And we must truly come together uh, you know, to, to have a future uh, for all species on this planet. So in a nutshell, I missed, I left out a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Red Nation. That was also very long. <laughs> it's okay. It's all good. You you actually answered my next question as well as talking about the Red Nation. I was going to ask you about this historical moment that we're in when the various things you've described, the centuries of colonial oppression, rapacious mm-hmm. capitalism, white supremacist violence, and environmental devastation are all intensifying and in existential crises of all sorts. Since this interview will air on the week of Indigenous Peoples Day, Mm. is there a significance of this day in this historical moment? Uh, Yes. I mean, I think um, I I host a podcast. It's a the Red Nation podcast. And I host a, a series within that called Red Power Hour, where Red Nation folks get together and talk about sometimes movies, but also like uh, current events. And I mentioned in a podcast episode about a month and a half ago that this summer was a long, hot summer of climate change. And it was intensely visceral for me. Um, I got really sick. Like it was, I felt the drought, I felt the heat. um, And I felt just like my body felt the intensity of, of climate change. And so something that we decided to do, so something else the Red Nation has developed over the years, uh, we used to call it the Native Liberation Conference. We held it annually um, every September, October. Um, we did not have it last year, of course, because of the pandemic, and we did not have an in-person one this year. So attached to Indigenous Peoples Day, at least what we're doing um, for Indigenous Peoples Day, we're having a little webinar series that we're just calling Native Liberation 2021. And we decided early in the summer, literally as the heat started to rise, that what we needed to focus on was climate change. Um, The uh, Indigenous Environmental Network recently released a report. Ooh, I might get the statistic wrong, but Indigenous people across North America and across the world have, you know, actually successfully because of frontline struggle um, prevented a, a massive amount of carbon emissions to enter the atmosphere and have been doing really a lot of work, right, to curb climate change, CO2 driven um, um, climate change. And so this year you are going everywhere that IPD is happening. I think almost all of those things are talking, those events um, are talking about climate change and how indigenous people are really, you know, I'm gonna use the word the vanguard (laughs) actually, I would say of resistance against climate change um, all over the world. And so, Um, Our IPD march and rally on Monday, um, this coming Monday, a week from now, will be focused on that. And just to give you a sense of what we're doing, I mean, the Red Nation is holding our own events online and then in Albuquerque, but we're sending comrades to Cochabamba in Bolivia, the historic gathering a decade ago, right, where 30,000 indigenous people came together and drafted the Cochabamba Agreement, the People's Accords, um, providing a radical you know, indigenous, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist program for how we must be addressing climate change that we've it very much inspired um, the Red Nation, the, the Red Deal, the book we published earlier this year, and very much inspires all of the efforts that we do. So we're sending comrades down there. We're sending comrades to Washington, D.C. Um, to protest Line 3, um, to, to protest ongoing resource extraction funding uh, from Congress and the Biden administration. 
And so really um, the Red Nation is gonna be all over the world, all over the Western hemisphere <laughs> next week. <laughs> um, and everyone that we're gonna be visiting with is talking about climate change and how indigenous people must be in leadership in the movements um, that are growing against climate change. And we are gravely serious because you know, the IPCC report that came out just about a month ago, or maybe it was a month and a half ago, really showed you know, what we're up against and if we don't do something, what is going to happen. And for indigenous people, it is an impossibility not to have a future. Literally our entire ways of life and being are premised on securing a future you know, for generations that we don't know yet and we'll never know, but that we must act as stewards of the future. That's literally what like indigenous politics are premised on, you know, in our knowledge and our, in our language systems. And so the prospect of not having a future, um, I think for me as an indigenous revolutionary is an impossibility. And the only way to ensure, um, you know, that we do have a future is to act and to act militantly and to act now um, at numbers larger than I think any of us have ever seen, even those of us who are seasoned organizers. Thank you for that. And I think really one of the examples of indigenous leadership and the vanguard role you described is the Red Deal. And I'd really like mm. to have us spend some time talking about that. Sure. Um, so, you know, a lot of people talk about a Green New Deal. A lot of people talk about addressing environmental crises, but not necessarily in a decolonial or anti-imperialist context. What is the Red Deal, and how is that different from a Green New Deal or some of the kinds of mainstream ways that people are talking about dealing with the environmental crises? Sure. Big question. Uh, so the Red Deal, um, which came out in April of 2021 um, with a, an imprint we started called Red Media. Um, Red Media is also kind of an offshoot of the Red Nation. They're not the same, but they are related Um that where we're basically just trying to publish kind of left radical indigenous content because there isn't really a place for that in the current publishing, you know, the spectrum of publishing that exists in the United States. And so we decided to publish this as kind of our, our book to launch the imprint um, with Common Notions Press. And so the Red Deal is, is a program for action. Um, the subtitle right is called Indigenous Action to Save Our Earth. And it was inspired by the Green New Deal, right? Um, that's why it's called the Red Deal, right? It's a play on that word. But what we really advance in this is um, that is quite different than at least the, the AOC driven kind of version of the Green New Deal is something that's very movement based, right? Um, we're not really interested in kind of the reformist approach that a lot of folks take when it comes to environmental politics at the national level in the United States. Uh, we believe, uh, we call it non-reformist reform, right? We believe from that we, if we build vibrant movements, the, you know, the ruling class, whether it's politicians or what have you, they must follow us because our power will be inevitable. And we have actually had like a smaller scale of success in, in the New Mexico political landscape doing this where we don't ask for permission, <laughs> you know, to organize about something. And we actually build pretty remarkable power with a movement or a campaign. And then those who have quote unquote power, right? And kind of state conferred power actually have to respond and, and follow us, they, they tail us. And so for us, this is kind of the version of non-reformist reform, this movement oriented approach to how we must, we think that we must be addressing climate change. Um, oftentimes I think what happens with the conversation around environmental politics is it's about consumerism and choice. Um, and so there's a very popular kind of element. Um, I think it's a liberal element about how we just need to like recycle more, you know, or we need to buy green, um, buy local, um, go to your local um, co-op instead of, you know, like a mega store like Walmart. And those things, th they do matter, right? Um, but what they don't necessarily tackle first, because it kind of, it sort of happens at an individual level, and we're not terribly interested in individual actions because we're a movement oriented um, approach to revolutionary struggle. And so we believe that um, it's actually the masses that create that kind of historic and, and structural shift that's required. Um, but that the thing that the movement is you know, pushing back against isn't individual purchasing power or like choices of the, the types of commodities that we buy and how green you know, they are, it's actually that we're trying to take on the structure of capitalism. 
And we know, right, that capitalism is a global force. It's a, it's a force that structures the entire globe. And so we truly need a mass movement, you know, to be able to, to take it on, um, to take it on head on. And that capitalism, in fact, um, you know, is the driving force for climate change. And the, you know, the most uh, egregiously capitalist country in the history of nation states called the United States, right? Um, which I think, you know, uses its military um, and other kind of imperial kind of technologies to continue to spread, you know, capitalism around the world. Um, and of course, if, you know, capitalism requires remarkable inequality and destruction, right? In order to continue to do its work and it's always looking for new horizons of profit and so you know those who are part of the underclass um the colonial underclass or the global south right those who who are really expendable within this larger calculation of global capitalism those are the people we believe will populate this movement and those are the folks we're talking about and we're talking to in the red deal um, we talk a lot about indigenous leadership of course um, I, I had talked about that earlier, right, um, in relationship to the larger movement against uh, climate change. And I have the book open in front of me, and I just want to say um, there are four principles to the Red Deal, and you can find this in the introduction. The first is what creates crisis cannot solve it. My, my conversation about sort of commodity or like how um, choice capitalism or green capitalism, like if I buy better, like the, the planet will heal kind of approach, um, we reject that approach to environmentalism, um, change from below into the left, right? Movements, politicians can't do it, only mass movements can do. I think I described that earlier as kind of the key difference between the Green New Deal and the Red Deal. And the last principle is from theory to action. Um, you know, the Red Nation has always been a very action-oriented uh, organization. I, you know, what happens a lot, I think on social media, and I'm an academic too, you know, so this also happens in kind of the, the bourgeois kind of arenas <laughs> that, that intellectuals, um, and I think sometimes activists also participate in, but it often sometimes feels like, you know, we're talking about ideas, um, and the war of ideas is incredibly important, you know, within movements, which is why we do media work, why we podcast. We think the war of ideas, th there was a cultural revolution, right? in the United States. So clearly the war of ideas, the war of symbolism is incredibly important to the larger struggle. Um, however, if that's, you know, if that's not driving and also, uh, you know, derived from action and the kind of building of struggle you must do with people, that's what struggle describes, um, then those ideas, you know, they don't, they don't quite matter as much unless they come from struggle and they feed struggle. And now more than ever, right, when we're facing this 30 year clock um, or less of um, pending climate doom, like, like extinction level <laughs> events for not just humanity, but all species on this planet, um, that was really what was on the, the front burner of our minds when we were writing the Red Deal. And I think it's audacious, you know, um, I think it is uh, tries to provide as comprehensive a plan, but also a way for people to plug in from all walks of life um, to be able to, you know, join this struggle. And we say that at the end of the Red Deal, we're like, we're waiting for you. You know, we're ready. We're waiting for you. Join us. And so that's a little bit about the Red Deal. That is such a powerful vision and so critical. What's the response that you've gotten to the Red Deal from indigenous communities, from some of the reform movements you're talking about? How have people engaged with what you're putting out? I mean, uh, it's been it's been in lots of different spaces. Um, I've seen academic panels <laughs> about the Red Deal, uh, uh, the DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, adopted a position on the Red Deal, um, so uh, they read it. The National. Um, I think, I don't know if it's the council um, committee. I'm not entirely sure what their national body um, governing body is. Um, we have students, um, you know, when we go out and we do presentations at tribal colleges or universities that have a lot of native students, a lot of those young people will come up and be like, hey, we read the Red Deal. Um, the, the reviews that we've received, um, some of which have appeared in left magazines um, or blogs have been overwhelmingly positive. Actually, I think that it resonates with people. I think it resonates with young people. 
we actually bought a bunch of copies um, of the book and distributed them in high schools, <laughs> um, especially uh, tribal high schools, um, high schools on reservations. There's a community, a Native American community academy here in Albuquerque, and we distributed a bunch of copies there. We literally hand the red deal out to our relatives on the street, <laughs> you know, or living on the street. Like it's, um, it's very much, you know, we want it in the hands of people, especially working class people um, and, and poor people and, and young people. And so I think those are the folks who've been primarily really inspired by it. And I think when it came out in April, it was a, it was high ranking. It was like the number one or the number two selling book in native American studies on Amazon wow. for a, a week, wow. which was completely wild. It was, that was a wild time. Um, but we're very, and it's truly, you know, I think sometimes people have these conceptions because of like capitalist media that only celebrities in the movement are the people who make decisions or they're like the talking heads, you know, from movements. And the Red Deal is not that at all. Truly, there were there were about 30 people who wrote this book. Um, I definitely I stewarded and kind of helped to bring all of the voices together and to edit it in a way that was very consistent, you know, because when you have a lot of different writers, the voice can be really inconsistent. Um, but truly this was a, a massive community project to bring this to fruition. It took two years, um, of work, whether it was research community meetings. Um, and so I, we're very, it's, it's a short little book. Uh, we like these short little books. I think they're digestible, they're teachable. Um, they can be used in movement spaces or in classrooms, um, which we find really, uh, like kind of the people that we wanted to be using the book. Um, and we're actually gonna publish more books like this, like short books that are still very action-based, very militant, <laughs> you know, um, with their politics. And one last thing I, I forgot to say about the one other major thing about um, the Red Deal is that we follow um, an abolitionist kind of tradition in that, you know, where will you get, there's always right this refrain like um, that kind of like mainstream politicians throw at kind of uh, at revolutionaries, you know, or radicals like, well, how are you going to implement that plan? Like, where are you going to get the money, you know, to do this amazing thing that you're proposing? And we're like, well, you could definitely divest from the military. <laughs> you could <laughs> you could divest from the in entire infrastructure of U.S. imperialism and pretty much like end hunger across the globe immediately save the lives of every child in the global south. I mean, like we actually calculated it and we're like literally tomorrow if the US even just reduced its military funding by 50%, I mean, that would like change the landscape of humanity across the globe if those resources were redistributed. So we believe in divesting, right, from state violence, um, from capitalism and, uh, and military and imperial violence and reinvesting that into what we call our common humanity, um, but not just in our people, right, but in the earth because uh, we have to heal the earth um, and our relationship with the earth, you know, of course, in order to have any kind of future. Um, and we believe, we believe very strongly the Red Deal also has a bit of prophecy behind it um, because we believe there will be a future beyond capitalism. You know, we believe there will be a future beyond the United States because we existed before those two things <laughs> came into existence. And despite, you know, the, the hardest work and, and the, the efforts of many um, who are the handmaidens of the agents of that, that violence of capitalism and settler colonialism, we never disappeared. And in fact, we're growing. And so we are evidence, you know, that this is not inevitable um, and that it is possible to build an, an, another world, you know, to emerge into another world and that we are at the precipice of that change and that time of a, of a new emergence. And, you know, we are here, we are waiting, we are ready. <laughs> When you talk about an abolitionist approach, you mentioned the military, for example. What other elements need to be abolished besides the military? Part one of um, and the occupation has five areas. Um, defunding police, ICE, uh, Customs and Border Protection, and Child Protective Services. And if folks have questions about that, I can say why we included that end border town violence, abolish incarceration, which includes the entire carceral spectrum, including cops and jails, end occupation everywhere, and abolish, abolish imperial borders. 
And so for us, these are the, the five key um, areas, right, in which in which imperialism does its work. These are the technologies through which it operates to, you know, police surveil and maim and kill, right? Um, millions of people, if not billions of people um, across the globe. And uh, well, I'll just mention it really quickly. The Child Protective Services one, um, you know, of course what's happening, we're talking about the current historical moment. I think everyone has seen the news of these mass graves of indigenous children, right? that are being discovered, quote unquote, um, over the last handful of months, I think since May, um, in Canada and in the United States at former boarding schools. Um, and the boarding schools are often thought of as the height of kind of colonial state abduction of children, right? As a, as a type of um, genocide, right? As a type of a, a colonial technique um, to essentially erase future generations, right? Of indigenous people. and. What I think a lot of people don't know is that in Canada, certainly, and, and definitely in the United States as well, but the child apprehension rate, like the number of indigenous children who are in the custody of the colonial state is actually larger than at the height of the residential and the boarding school era of the earlier part of the 20th century. And so even today, the technique is different, but indigenous child removal is still a primary kind of tactic of um, colonial policy and uh, genocide that indigenous people continue to face. And boarding schools themselves, I, my dad went to a boarding school and he, you know, he described it as a kind of prison, you know, and you're taught it's very hyper-militarized. Carlisle Indian School um, started out as a military school and it is still a military base. Um, and sandwiched in between was the, the boarding school, the Indian boarding school. And so for native people, one of the primary like technologies of, of the carceral state has actually been indigenous child removal and the way that the state steals our children because it's trying to steal our future, right? Because it's trying to complete the project of conquering <laughs> indigenous nations um, by preventing us a future. Um, and so we wanted to include that because um, people don't talk much about it, but uh, it's, a, it's a really important um, aspect of you know, the larger prison industrial complex, you know, carceral complex that, that the United States and Canada um, very much perpetrate. Absolutely. You've mentioned a number of different sources of information for people who want to learn more or get active. You mentioned the Red Nation book, the podcasts, conference and events that you're doing. Can you just kind of summarize if people want to get plugged in to both learn more and get more active, where would you suggest they go? Yeah, I think um, our podcasts, I think, are the best thing we got going on <laughs> right now. Um, we really beefed up our media production during COVID because it was the only thing <laughs> we could beef up um, living in isolation, um, being a very Zoom based lifestyle over the last year and a half. And so um, I would say the Red Nation podcast, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. Um, you can go to the Red Nation's Twitter feed or Instagram feed um, and find episodes there. But the podcasts are really, about providing political education, um, about you know issues that are important to people, um, but also just providing like an analysis, right, a left indigenous analysis that you kind of can't find anywhere else, even on other indigenous produced podcasts. To be frank, um, I don't think people have the same kind of kind of the same political commitments um, and read on things that we do. And, and so I think that that would be the best place. Uh, you can join our Patreon. So the Patreon, um, a lot of podcasts, right, have Patreon. Uh, you can subscribe to special content on the podcast through Patreon. And if you subscribe at any level, that money goes directly into funding the media work itself, mutual aid with indigenous poor and working class communities, primarily in urban areas, and also paying native women. Um, to do this media work and to train them, you know, to become media experts um, for the revolution, to do revolutionary media, essentially. Um, and so I would say that the podcasts are the best thing that folks can do to plug in. Um, we're totally ourselves. You'll get to know us listening to the podcast. I swear too much <laughs> on my <laughs> podcast, but you'll get to know us. You'll get like, we are 100% authentic um, in the way that we talk. And, you know, as the Red Nation hopefully starts to rise again, you know, as the pandemic hopefully starts to calm down, there will be much more hopefully ac action-based things 
that folks can get involved with in the future. But, you know, we're still we're still kind of easing into that transition and just trying to be very careful, um, especially because of the Delta variant. So. Sure. Thanks for that. Is there anything else you want to say that I haven't asked you about or any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Oh, goodness. Um, I mean, I think, you know, the, the pandemic, you know, has been a trying time. And many of us, as we often do in the movement, go into crisis mode and emergency mode where, you know, we're just trying to stay afloat whether we're trying to keep our communities afloat or just trying to survive ourselves. And, um, you know, the election of Joe Biden was not anything to celebrate. <laughs> I've been chewed out by white liberals for saying that. Um, not but here. That go that's, good. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's um, good. But I would encourage people, even if you're in a state of despair, you know, because it's, it's a hard time to be alive. Um, with what we're going through as a species, you know, as living beings on this planet, it is time to act. And that the, you know, the whatever trauma or, you know, difficulties we're facing as individuals, it is actually important sometimes to put those things aside because the, what we're facing is not something we're facing on an individual level, it's a planetary level, you know, and we must really rise to the occasion and we needed to do it yesterday <laughs> together. Um, and so I would just want to encourage everyone to be active again and to be really active. And let's build this, you know, let's build this liberation movement um, because if ever there was a time to do it, um, it would be now. Well said. And I so appreciate you sharing your just deeply inspiring vision and powerful resistance and happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Happy Indigenous Peoples Day.